right to language is part of the very foundation of their survival, the dignity and well-being of indigenous peoples worldwide. Tonight, the United Nations International Year of Indigenous Languages wraps up in New York. So surprised, disappointed, but at the same time, uh, we, you know, looking back, we see this as a great opportunity now uh, for somebody else. Chevron is selling its stake in the Kitimat Liquid Natural Gas Project. I think that during the holiday season it's important, even more so because uh, we should give gifts that are meaningful. And what's the best way to support Indigenous artists while honoring their cultures? Good evening, welcome to APTN National News, I'm Dennis Ward. The United Nations Year of Indigenous Languages came to an end today. Canada was represented by the government and Indigenous leaders. The year-long event was all about awareness, but as Todd Lamoran reports, the work to save these languages is far from over. It's uh, also my great uh, honour to congratulate uh, Ali Yalitza Aparicio. This year's Goodwill Ambassador is an Indigenous actress from Mexico. Yelitsa Aparicio is best known for her Oscar-nominated performance as an Indigenous maid in the 2018 film Roma. She related the story of how her parents only spoke Spanish at home, thinking they were protecting her. No boy or girl should grow up feeling ashamed of their roots. They should know that speaking an indigenous language is a reason for pride. It reveals a world in all its very rich dimensions. I trust that as we defend our linguistic heritage in each community, other people will get to recognize the beauty behind each mother tongue. AFN National Chief Perry Balgard addressed the UN General Assembly and began his remarks in Cree. Balgard said language is a fundamental human right. The right to language is part of the very foundation of the survival, the dignity and well-being of indigenous peoples worldwide. We all know that colonialism caused profound harm to cultures and traditions of indigenous peoples around the world. And that even includes the actions trying to destroy our languages. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller spoke in Mohawk, as he's done a number of times lately. In English, he spoke about how three-quarters of Indigenous languages in Canada are endangered and brought up Bill C-91. The Government of Canada and Indigenous partners worked relentlessly together to create the Indigenous Languages Act. I want to acknowledge the outstanding work of all Indigenous partner organizations in the co-development of this legislation. Many speakers today call the International Year a good start. Black actions which are being carried out in various countries to rescue languages do not end at the end of the year. Rather, they should continue for the whole of eternity so that no more of our history is lost. Even before this traditional opening began the event today, it was announced there will be an international decade of Indigenous languages. It begins in 2022 and runs to 2032. Todd Lamoran, EPTN National News, Ottawa. To the Conservative Party leadership now, where CTV News is reporting that Rona Ambrose is considering the possibility of running for the party's top job. CTV News is citing an unnamed source who says the former interim Conservative leader is thinking it over after enjoying a transition that has her, quote, squarely entangled in the private sector. She's also considering factors like her health, freedom, family time and privacy and had, quote, never imagined going back to politics. If Rona enters the race, she'll be up against a number of Conservative powerhouses including former Defence Minister Peter McKay, MP Pierre Polivare, and MP Erin O'Toole. To Thunder Bay now, where the second-degree murder trial of Braden Bushby has been postponed. Bushby's trial was scheduled to start in Thunder Bay Court in January, but his defence is waiting for an appeal decision about jury selection. 
34-year-old Barbara Kentner died months after she was hit with a trailer hitch while walking down the street. It's alleged Bushby threw the hitch at Kentner from inside a vehicle that drove by. Bushby's trial is now expected to start on April 6, 2020. Four First Nations in British Columbia are currently in court again to try and stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project. The four are part of the original six nations who were successful in having the project quashed back in August of 2018. Two of the nations have since signed agreements with Trans Mountain. They're arguing in the Federal Court of Appeal this week about why they believe the renewed consultation efforts with the federal government fell short in each of their communities. It's about uh, the nature of Canadian uh, decision making. Um, in a climate crisis, should we be continuing to build fossil fuel infrastructure uh, against the wishes of Indigenous people in a way that violates their rights? Uh, last time around, the federal court took some 10 months to uh, issue their decision after the close of the hearing. I don't expect it'll be this, that, quite that long this time around. Still in BC, where the natural gas industry took a bit of a hit last week, when Chevron announced plans to sell its 50% stake in the Kitimat LNG project in the northern part of the province. But local leaders are optimistic a new partner will be found. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. In early December, Chevron announced it will be selling their 50% stake in Kitimat LNG. This would include the proposed 471 kilometer Pacific Trail Pipeline and Kitimat LNG plant. In a written statement, the company states, the Kitimat LNG project decision is part of Chevron's global portfolio optimization effort focused on improving returns and driving value. Chevron also stated they will be working with joint venture partner Woodside Energy, Government, First Nations as they transition out. The move looked at as a setback for the natural gas industry in BC, but Kitimat Mayor Phil Germuth says this is an opportunity for another investor. I'm so surprised, disappointed, but at the same time, uh, we, you know, looking back, we see this as a great opportunity now uh, for somebody else to come in. They have a great, great project to market out there. Uh, you know, they have all uh, First Nations along the pipeline route, all 16 are in support of it. You have the communities in support of it. They have the site that's cleared. This is not the first time the project changed hands. In 2012, Chevron bought the 50% stake from EOG Resources. Currently, Kitimat LNG says they are still on track. So there, there's no changes right now. For now, it's business as usual. Uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to support uh, Chevron being able to go out there and, and help market their 50%. But, you know, there's no doubt Kitimat is a great place to invest. There are 16 benefit agreements in place with First Nations along the proposed pipeline, with the Heisla Nation and Kitimat Village as a major beneficiary, and the proposed terminal will be located on reserve land at Beach Cove. We asked the Heisla Nation for a comment on the Chevron pullout, but they did not respond before airtime. Mayor Grimuth, however, is optimistic that the project will transition to another partner. We look forward to working with all the proponents. Uh, they've all been great to work with, and, uh, you know, uh, the LNG industry will be a game changer for Kitimat. But having said that, you know, uh, still the anchor of this community has always been the aluminum industry. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat, British Columbia. And we want to hear what you have to say. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest Indigenous news. Award-winning musician Don Amaro made the leap into music late in life, but music has always played a huge role for him. Tonight on a new episode of Face to Face, right after the news... Amaro tells us how his life could have turned out a lot different if not for music.
all my friends in the neighborhood, I grew up here in the north end of Winnipeg and, um, you know, high poverty and, and, and a lot of brokenness in, in, in a lot of homes in that area that I lived in. Um, and, uh, you know, they would get into, you know, gangs, drugs, alcohol, violence, all that kind of thing. And I just, I could see those as dead end roads, you know, and um, again, I was just blessed with that foresight. But music very quickly became my vice. It became the thing that I leaned on, you know, and like I said to you earlier, like whenever I go through something emotional, my response is to write about it and, and write a song about it. And, uh, you know, I realized that became my therapy and my outlet. Still to come, we speak with one of the authors of a new report on the implementation of the TRC's 94 Calls to Action. Stay with us. Here's a look at Wednesday's weather forecast starting on the east coast. Minus 3 for Charlottetown and St. John's. Snow and 0 in Halifax. Snow and 0 for Nain. Plus 1 with snow for Cartwright. Minus 4 with a rain-snow mix in Montreal. 18 below with snow for Shibugamu. Minus 1 in London. Plus 1 in Toronto with snow. Minus 18 for Thunder Bay and Sioux Lookout where snow is on the way. 24 below and snow for Churchill. Minus 17 and snow for God's Lake. 10 below with flurries for Winnipeg, Gimli, Princess Harbor and Barron's River. Sunny and zero for Regina and Esteban. Plus one under the sun for Swift Current. Minus eight in Meadow Lake. 10 below with snow in the Rock. Welcome back. A First Nation-led think tank has taken a look at the implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. Shortly after the TRC released its 94 calls in June 2015, then-Liberal Party leader Justin Trudeau promised to fully implement the recommendations. Trudeau doubled down on that promise shortly after becoming Prime Minister However, a report re released today by the Yellowhead Institute says only nine of the calls to action have been implemented. For more, we're joined by Ian Mosby, a co-author of the report. Ian, thanks for joining us. What can you tell us about the nine of the 94 calls to action that have been implemented? Well, I think uh, one thing that the nine have in common is that a lot of them are, are, they require the least sort of substantial, substantive or systemic changes. Mm. Uh, a lot of them are, are sort of symbolic gestures, for instance, like um, stating that Indigenous languages um, are, are an Aboriginal right, for instance. That didn't require actually significant changes as opposed to, to some other calls to action like actually funding Indigenous language programs. So it's been more than four years since the calls to action were released. What's preventing them from being implemented? Well, we, we gave a number of different um, possibilities. You know, a big part of it is there, there is this level of paternalism, I think, um, that's at the heart of uh, the way Canada uh, interacts with Indigenous peoples, um, you know, at all levels of government. And this idea that um, Indigenous communities, for instance, need to develop capacity before they can be trusted with funding for things like education, child welfare, language. Um, you know, that, that plays a really big role. Um, part of it is priorities. Canada has not made um, actually implementing these calls to action a priority. And we can see that in recent cases um, around child welfare of Canada, mm -hmm. you know, um, refusing to pay um, what what is what is required of it from the human rights tribunal um and part of this is because it sees you know the the public interest as being different than the interests of indigenous peoples at this rate your analysis finds it will be another 38 years before the calls to action are implemented what has to happen to speed up that process i think the the government needs to put its money where its mouth is it's very easy to talk a big talk on reconciliation um but actually doing what needs to be done to get these calls to action met requires you know putting in real resources you know one of the most important things to think about in these calls to action is this isn't this is the minimum required to get indigenous peoples in canada up to the same level of of the rest of canada you know these are the minimum 
required. And so this needs to be a major priority. And yes, it's going to cost money. And yes, it's going to require real substantive and systemic changes. But this is this is the bare minimum uh, at this point. And I think this is something that's really important to remember when we think about the calls to action. Well, Ian, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, appreciate your work on this and you taking some time for us here today. Thank you so much. With the holiday shopping season well underway, or just about to start for some, Indigenous artists and crafters are out in force selling their wares. Here now is an encore presentation of a story by Willow Fiddler on what Indigenous art is, who should buy it, and who should wear it. Local markets and craft fairs abound this time of year. In Thunder Bay, many of those artists and crafters are Indigenous, and they want your support. I think that during the holiday season it's important, even more so because uh, we should give gifts that are meaningful and that people will want to uh, display in their homes for a long period of time and they'll cherish forever. Sean Hedekin is a self-taught Anishinaabe artist. He wants consumers to consider local Indigenous artists when out looking for the perfect gift. Especially if you're buying from, say, a tourist shop or, or whatnot. A lot of the pieces are inauthentic and lack meaning and are also completely manufactured overseas. Louise Thomas is the owner of Anishinaabe Art Gallery in downtown Thunder Bay. She teamed up with a nearby business to host an Indigenous arts and crafts sale recently. Uh, the Indigenous art scene is quite huge in our community and um, I'm, I'm very, very proud that I can be a, a small part of it, you know, having this gallery for uh, Indigenous artists to display their works. And... Hannah Dockstader Wynn is no stranger to that scene. She learned the craft from her dad. I would start going to these Christmas sales and arts and craft sales with him and um, I began making my chokers, traditional chokers. She says the craft is a way to reconnect with her ancestors. Because me making the chokers, my dad was actually the one who taught me and it was his great grandpa who taught him and they used to actually go on the powwow trail as a full-time thing. To avoid cultural appropriation, these artists say buying from indigenous artists or crafters is the best way to support and honor their cultures. I think it's important because it's, it's coming from like real indigenous people um, with the knowledge and like the teachings behind what they're actually making. And it's, um, it's handmade and uh, it's, it's not like it's coming from a huge company or like uh, industry. Hedekin says not knowing where the product comes from can be harmful. The danger is uh, you're contributing to the cultural genocide, but also that um, you're helping to uh, render our culture meaningless when you, you buy things that uh, lack the symbolism or the care and attention and the craftsmanship that goes into it. Jean Marshall is an Anishinaabe crafter who quit her job to be full-time from her home. She says she's often asked how long it took her to make something. And that's never the question I'm thinking about when I make something. I never think, like, how long is this taking me? And I don't have a timer timing myself. But that's always the first question. She says Indigenous-made products are often undervalued by consumers and even the artists themselves. You may not understand how many hours actually went into the moccasins or the mitt or the beaver hat or how long it took to tan that hide or who went to trap the beaver. All of these details that are going into the item that you bought. And once that item is bought, they want you to know it's okay to wear and display it. But there are people who ask, they're like, oh, is it okay if I wear this? I'm not indigenous. And I'm like, yeah, of course you can wear it. I, I think it's okay as long as you're supporting like the indigenous artists who actually make it. Yeah, I think it's important to support local um, indigenous crafters because um, Because we're deadly. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Willow Fiddler, APTN National News, Thunder Bay. <laughs> no, don't put that on there. Time for another quick break, but first a look at a story we're working on about a grandmother in Hamilton calling for a coroner's inquest into the death of her 16-year-old grandson. 
Nina's here. He used to call me Nina at first. So he would come crawling across the floor with his head down, just like a big old bear. And I said, that's it. From now on, you're Boo Bear. And I said, I wonder if you'll mind when he's 21 if I still call him Boo Bear. But even as he didn't reach 17, he was just a few months short of turning 17, but he loved it. He, it was affection to him. Even everybody else that talked to him, like within the family, mm -hmm. it was always, uh, he was always referred to as Boo. Here's the rest of Wednesday's weather forecast, picking back up in northern Alberta. Sunny and 24 below for high level. Plus 4 in Medicine Hat, plus 5 for Lethbridge. Showers and 8 above in Vancouver and Victoria. Rain and plus 7 for Campbell River. Minus 22 under sunny skies in Fort Nelson. Uh, rain, snow mix and plus 4 in Prince George. Uh, chilly, minus 35 in Old Crow. 10 below with snow for Whitehorse. Minus 24 and flurries for Fort Liard and Trout Lake. Minus 39 in Yellowknife. 32 below for Anuvik and Pulatuck. Minus 43 in Colville Lake. Minus 36 for Baker Lake. 29 below in Whale Cove and Chesterfield. Minus 9 in Arctic Bay. 5 below for Igloolik. Welcome back. The family might be forever frozen in time, but today the Simpsons turns the big three dope. The show's first episode aired 30 years ago today, after running for two years as an animated short on the Tracy Ullman Show. It's the longest running scripted primetime series, having surpassed Gunsmoke last year. There have been rumors in recent weeks of the show nearing its end, but for now it's being renewed through its 32nd season. Starting today, some Canadians can buy cannabis edibles for Christmas, but three of the country's biggest provinces will have to wait another month. It's looking more like mid-January for recreational pop products to hit the shelves in Ontario Quebec and Alberta, those provinces run their own distribution systems which have stricter regulations. And that's your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. Tune in tomorrow for a packed edition of In Focus featuring Whoopi Goldberg's medallion, red dress Christmas ornaments, and much more. That's live at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And stick around. Face to Face is next with our guest Don Amaro to get you in the Christmas spirit. We'll leave you tonight with something else to get you in the holiday mood. Earlier this week, Santa stopped in for the Christmas supper in Saddle Lake Cree Nation. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.